Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark Schwetz and I'm a developer for Chariot Solutions. Um, I have to tell all of you that we're in for a real treat. Uh, last year we saw Jessica's keynote, we learned uh, that we are all semanticists in the medium of software. We learned that great teams make great people and if you haven't watched that talk, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, and now we're back for more. Uh, the people we are so lucky to have here again, one of my favorite speakers, Jessica Kerr, interviewed by Abdi Grimm. Thanks, Mark. Hello, and welcome to the Jesse Tron Show. <laughs> uh, Jess, uh, how are you feeling? Oh. <laughs> Next question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Terrible. But, <laughs> but hey, this is the closest we get to a conference, so um, I'm going to enjoy it. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to this. Um, Jess, what have you been thinking about recently? Okay. So last year, I talked about how we're all semanticists, and this time I want to talk about how we're all scientists and world builders. World builders and scientists. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you... Hmm? Go ahead. Uh, can you expand on that? Okay. Yes. But I'm going to start with video games. Uh, so up like a month ago, um, Animal Crossing's New Horizons came out, and this is the perfect time of the world for Animal Crossings, and my, my kids taught me how to play. So in Animal Crossing, for instance, you, you see like a glowy piece of ground, and if you dig with your shovel, you find a bag of money, and if you put the bag of money back in the ground, I mean, you can keep the bag of money and just fill in the hole, or you can put the bag of money back in the ground, or, or even more money back in the ground. And whatever money you put back in the ground, it becomes a little tree. And that tree grows over a week. And as soon as it's fully grown, pop, 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 it produces three bags of money. So you get three times as much. This is the physics of Animal Crossing. And th there's a lot more to it, but any game that you start playing, uh, a lot of the play of the game is discovering how that world works because every game is its own world. So the, the, the various things, the fishing is like, wow, this is how fishing would be in heaven, where you can see the fish and they're predictable. And then the only thing that's random is which fish you get, it's great. Um, and this has led me to kind of a theory of Animal Crossing, which is surprises are good. The worst thing that can happen is you get stung by wasps and your eye swells up and you make this cute little pouty face. Surprises are good, explore everything, shake trees. It's a very friendly game. Uh, but every game is like this with world exploration. Uh, my husband, for instance, he plays a Path of Exile and it's kind of the anti-animal crossing. I mean, for one thing, the objective is to kill things and try not to die. Uh, but for another thing, it's incredibly complicated. The, the world in this game is so intricate I asked him the other day, I'm like, tell me how these maps work. Cause sometimes in the, the main game, which he calls base reality, uh, that the monsters will drop like a map and you can pick it up and like he picked up a wharf map. Okay. And then you take this wharf map and you can put it in your personal map device and then you can go to that wharf area, but not to that wharf area, to an instance of that wharf area. But before you do that, you can modify the map with various cartographer's tools so that when you go to that instance, it will drop more treasure. And, and then you could, you could modify it further. He has an antagonist's castle ruins map of rust, which is a map of a castle ruins area, but the rust modifier makes your armor less effective and the antagonists makes the monsters more rare, which means they'll drop better treasure. But all this is like, amazingly complex uh and and then and then you, there's like all these third party sites there's uh places where you can buy and sell stuff online that are just starting to be incorporated into the main game um there's essential sites for filters of things that dropped because the items you want to pick up depend on like what season it is and what's popular that season and what you can sell in that oh my gosh and and he can talk about this till my eyes drool um so what does that have to do with science? Uh, uh, so, so the thing is that when you go to these games, you have to figure that stuff out. Um, and, and it's like you're discovering a world, right? You're discovering how a world works. 
And in real life, in like physical reality, base reality, <laughs> we call that science. And it's, it's a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. Just like, I mean, Animal Crossing is simple enough. You can figure most of it out by yourself. We don't use the internet a whole lot. But we do interact with each other in the game. But in Path of Exile, man, that game does not exist just in the game. It exists in the community. Uh, so there's a community that is doing science uh, to, to figure out what happens and to, to like uh, come up with strategies for characters. It's almost like engineering a build of a character and the items that you need and stuff like that to, to find something that's both useful and possible. Now, um, lately, I, I've been hearing you talk about how there's like this science. It isn't just you're not just like characterizing the world, but there's there's an aspect of theory building to it. Ah, OK. Yeah. Characterizing would be I can tell you all these weird facts about maps. But what makes this powerful is that I, I, I don't. OK, I got a little bit of a theory about how just the map part works mm -hmm. by digging in and asking questions. And that theory involves, oh, they're spinning up instances on Amazon because <laughs> they only hang around for 15 minutes. And then that instance of the area is gone. And um, uh, yeah, but you're building a theory of how the world works. Like in Animal Crossing, surprises are nice. Not so in Path of Exile. But this is also what we do in the real world. In science, we have over generations built up theories. From those theories, we create hypotheses. And from those hypotheses, we create experiments. And the thing is, this is also what we do as developers, like all day long, is world exploration. Because just like every video game is a new world, every, um, every language system is a new world. Uh, every programming language and runtime and dependency manager, every library is a new world. Every framework, definitely. It's kind of a game with its own rules. Yeah, yeah. And now it's not designed to be fun to explore. You know, it's not going to, it's not just, they're not currently designed <laughs> to step you through step by step. Your first fight, you learn how to hit things. And your second fight, you learn how to dodge, like in Final Fantasy. But, uh, but we are, uh, we each live in a different world in the computer because we have a different operating system. We have a different development environment. We have different IDEs and tools and plugins and everything. Most of us have a unique environment that we live in. Now, aspects of that are shared mm. and therefore we share information. But I think whenever we're learning a new tool or language, we're doing science at best. So we're like, like science with a little S, right? Because you've got big S science uh -huh. in the, the big N nature physical world. Um, but then each, just like a computer game is its own world, uh, our, our language systems are its own world. And we explore those. And there's like, there's like a theory behind it that we're developing and then Hopefully. testing that. Hopefully. Hopefully. Okay. We, well, we do develop, we always develop theories about it. The oh, question yeah. is whether... Whether that maps, right? Whether that Whether maps to accurate and yeah. consistent and useful. Useful, yeah. Okay. Constructive. Yeah. Let, let, let's do let's do a let's do a demo oh, yes, of, of how learning um, a new language system can be like science and can mm. be more like science than than magic, uh, if we're careful. Okay, so I wanted to pick a topic that I mean some of us understand really well, but a lot of us just still really don't get. Um, so let's talk about CSS because it's hard. All right, share screen. I want to share this. Oh, no, I want to share the whole screen. Um, all right, so here is a web page. Starting point for this story is like 25 years ago, I in college, we made little HTML pages. Uh, so I can I understand a little bit of HTML. That's fine. I can remember body and P and image and stuff like that. Um, and, but back then we didn't even have CSS. We just had like float equals left and tables and tables. Right. Right. But now say I've made this, this, um, this sad web page, and I want to do some formatting. And I know that there's such a thing called CSS and that that's how formatting gets done these days. That's how you're supposed to do it. Yes. Yes. So I consult the community and Google. Get started with CSS. Where Google is still DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo, Duck, 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 yes. Today. I can Google this on DuckDuckGo. 
this is fine. Um, <laughs> and I can, I can look for a spell. Now what I'm doing here is looking up a spell because I don't know how to do this, but somebody does and they've published this online, of course. Our starting point is an HTML document. Yes, I'm good with that. Adding CSS, that's what I want. Okay, so I have found a two part spell. Um, there's this link, which I can kind of interpret based on HTML familiarity. And then there's something in a styles.css file. Okay, if as developers, we are magicians um, and we can cast these spells and poof, change the world that we're working in. But what I want to be is more of a scientist. So I can take this spell and use it as an input to uh, forming hypotheses and then larger theories of how CSS really works under the covers. Um, it's like the principles that govern it. Um, and, and if I can do that, then I can bend it to my will. Mm. Okay. Start so, coming up with new combinations instead of just copying other people's spells. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. a spell, you know, you wiggle your magic wand in a certain way and you get what you get. And if you don't get that, you're like, oh, did I wiggle it wrong or did I pronounce the words wrong? Um, I, I, but when you understand how it works, then it becomes technology right. that we can work with. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so to do that, I'll start with the absolute minimum that I can do. Step one is to add this line inside the head of the HTML. All right, so I throw this in here. Now, to make this an experiment, I want to break this down into tiny experiments so I can learn as much as possible. Um, I need to see something different. Uh, and I mean, my guess is that this href is going to be a link to a file called styles, which would need to be in the same directory, and that doesn't exist. So I don't think this is going to work. But can I see a difference? Uh, here's my web page, control R. No, I don't see a difference here. But, but one of the magic. What did you just do? You did a control R. I did control R reload. Okay. Thank you. Um, but one of our powers in software, as opposed to the physical world, is that we have a choice. We can make the world tell us what's going on. Like in, in, in uh, genetic biology, um, when you're trying to like put a new gene in some seeds, um, you just have to like hurl the gene at the seeds. And how do you know which one's got in? Ah, well, in, in, while they're doing research, they'll use a marker gene and include that in the sequence they're trying to insert and the marker gene like glows under black light or something, um, or re re results in the production of a protein that glows under black light. <laughs> um, it doesn't like literally glow. Anyway, um, so you, in, you include that marker gene and you like hurl a bunch of genes and you just hope that some of the, some of them land and go in and get inserted. Uh, our lives are so much easier because I can open up the developer tools because the world of the browser includes this. This is Edge, but Chrome developer tools. Um, and look, it tells me, oh yeah, control R to record network activity. So I hit that again. Ha, and now I see a difference. This wasn't there before. You've got your marker protein there. Yeah, basically. We have so many options to make the world we're exploring more explorable. Uh, and getting to know developer tools is one of those. Um, yeah, so 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 I my hypothesis seems to be confirmed. I can I can make certain that's exactly where it's coming from by like change the name, refresh. Aha, yep. Now it tried to load styles too. Okay, so the minimum change that I can make next is to create. That's a tiny piece of a model you just created. Like a tiny piece of theory you just created there was was that this this file name maps directly to something it's going to try and load. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that seems trivial, but it's a useful technique for, um, for much more complicated things. Yeah. But we were doing that yesterday, trying to figure out the AWS SAM CLI, which is a whole different piece. <laughs> okay, so if I create uh, styles.css, then I, I think I should not get a 404. It should load, but the page should look the same. So let's see if I'm right about that. Yes, no 404. Now let's check the page. Yeah, it looks the same. Okay, so I've learned something. Now I need to copy the rest of the spell. Where was it? The last piece of the spell is to put this in. Um, my theory is uh, just based on pattern matching and all of our theories are always based on the theories we held before. 
H1 looks like um, an HTML tag to me. So, and color red, I, I'm definitely guessing that this world worlds will turn red. Okay. Now That's that I, I, yes, now that I put this in there. So come back, open the web page. Where you go? Here it is. Refresh. Dang it! Not red. Hmm. Okay. My hypo my my experiment failed, which means I'm about to learn something. No. Good way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. This this is a this is a surprise. That's an opportunity. Now I could just try to tweak the spell or something, mm -hmm. um, or cast other spells like restarting my computer. That one almost always works. <laughs> Worked on Sam the other day. It did. <laughs> um, but let's let's do some more investigation. Okay, can I see a change? If I look at this, I see the request has no response data available. That's that's unexpected. Uh, I know a spell that often works short of restarting my computer. It's called clear the browser cache. Let's try that spell. Ah! Red. Red. That nice. did it. Okay. Now I don't want to clear the browser cache every time. Does that add something to your to your hypothesis? No, I don't know why. Why does that even work? Hmm. So so I can Google that. Let's see what did I Google next? Browser refresh CSS. How do I get that to work? Um, and here I'm accessing the community again because indeed I'm not the only one with this question. Blah blah blah. Ha! I should have pushed Control Shift R to force a cache reload. Okay. Bummer. Anytime you make changes to CSS, yeah, you'll see this concern. So I am sad, but I've learned something. I, in fact, in this case, I had to update my mental model of how the browser works. And then it doesn't update CSS all the time. Now, I could, I could go further down this. Um, I could learn about why is CSS not reloaded? Is it like hard coded in the browser that CSS doesn't get reloaded? Or is there some sort of DNS thing? Or is, there, is it the, like the HTML headers? Mm. Maybe I could solve this problem by, by running a, an HTTP server instead of like HTTP-server, the simple one, um, that forces or does auto refresh. Mm -hmm. you can, you can, I know you can get ones that automatically refresh your page without me having to push anything. But right now, let's see if this spell works. Let's test it, uh, dark blue. Uh, okay, so we changed that. Now when I come back here and I hit Control Shift R, dark blue. Okay. Okay. That spell is good enough for right now. Right now I'm investigating CSS and I don't want to dig into how HTTP in the browser works any further than I already have. So I choose to pause. Yeah, there's always a lot of different sort of scientific domains available to us that we kind of pass through on the way to the ones that... So many yaks to study. <laughs> Yeah, so, okay. All right, so now I've, I've got that spell working and I've gained some understanding of it. Um, and my next thing is uh, these pictures. I can't even see the whole pictures. Okay, I can What do get, you want to? Okay. What, what, what do, do I want, want them to look like? Well, first I want to be able to see them. Okay, so like more of the picture. Like make them smaller. Visible. Okay. Yeah, and okay. So now I'm, I'm making some guesses based on this looks like a tag, so I could use an image tag. And I remember from back in the day that I can specify width, so I'll just, in, in pixels, so I'll just uh, copy this formatting. Uh, and then we'll hit Control Shift R. Yay, oh, we can see two pictures. Nice. Okay, I like how they're next to each other. Um, oh, but I wish they would be centered in the page and centered with each other vertically and centered in the page horizontally. Yeah, instead of like scooched over to the left the way they are right now. Yeah, yeah. And my theory about CSS, my underlying very vague, not very good theory, is that it's there so I can tell the browser how to display the page, where to put stuff on the page. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another beautiful thing about web development now is that you can do experiments really fast because you can open developer tools and click on this stuff. And I could be like, well, I want images to be align center, align items, align self, align content. Ah, it's time to Google something. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I look up alignment um, and, oh, and 
here, here's a secret that I, I know from my friends in the community. Tag MDN on the end of your search and you get the right article. Yes. <laughs> so if I go, I go here and blah, blah, blah. And it starts talking about, I don't know about boxes, older alignment methods. Yes, that's what I want. I'm trying to use dead simple CSS here. Okay, it says text align, auto margins, and vertical align. Ah, let's try all of them. <laughs> so I, I mean, I can, and I can do that. Text align, center, um, margin, auto. I know, I know, that's the default, but I didn't always know that. Um, uh, vertical align, center. Ah, now here is a beauty. It's even telling me that that doesn't work. Invalid property value. Uh, middle, right, sure. And I can refresh the, oops, don't refresh the page. Okay, I just took away my properties, that's fine. But it was doing the vertical align. Did you see that before I hit refresh Briefly, and screwed yeah. it up? Yeah. Yeah. Just sort of aligned with, with regard to the other person. Yeah, but it wasn't horizontally aligned. Mm -hmm. no, um, they're still scooched over to the left. They were yeah. Scooched. So I could try something like, uh, oh, I remember that float was a thing. So maybe I want this one to float to the left and this one to float to the right. Oh, wait. Well, I would like to float to center, but no, that's not a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the, the tools here are awesome because they're, they're not only giving me ways to run experiments faster, but they're constantly giving me clues to help me update my model and get closer and do better experiments. Middle, no, 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 right? Okay. And if I look at that. Oh. Well, I'm like, they're on either side, but what is that text doing in the middle? And then I start saying, why? Why would anyone want to do this? And eventually my, my experiments fail enough mm -hmm. and my hypotheses are garbage enough that I'm like, okay, Jess, you need to go deep and update your theory. Now, in big S science in the real world, theory updates are slow. They happen maybe once in a generation and we call that a scientific revolution. Right, I couldn't talk about. Yeah. Um, we get to have those little scientific revolutions in our head a lot more often. Um, I was talking to Eric Evans yesterday and he was, he was saying that he has been using reactive streams and just the other day he, he investigated far enough to really grasp the difference between a hot and cold observable and it was like, ah, and he's like, I'm still tingling. <laughs> Uh, and he even said it was like a little, a mini scientific revolution, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so I need one of those for CSS. And I recognize the need for that because the, 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 the world that I'm experimenting in, my computer is not validating. You keep hypothesis. throwing out these hypotheses that seem reasonable based on your... Yeah, but they're really crap. Theory. They're and totally they're not crap. panning out. Yeah, yeah. So clearly I need a different theory. Now, in... in um, real big ass science, um, those are hard to come by. Mm. But we're lucky because in the natural world, there is no authoritative source of knowledge. It's just whatever we've come up with that we haven't been able to prove false in spite of lots of trying. It's the, right. it's the best we have. Um, there is no truth, there is useful. <laughs> But in software, we have hope because we have access to the creators of this world in some cases. We have documentation, we have specifications. Um, and, and sometimes we have access to the code. If we really want to dig, we have sources of knowledge that have some authority. Mm -hmm. um, so is that your next, your next course? Yeah, so at some point I actually broke down and read some of the CS. CSS spec, mm -hmm. just like the 2.1, the basic um, CSS specification, and it really helped. Mm. Also, uh, well, first of all, I learned that CSS is not about telling the browser where to put stuff oh. because you can't know that you. Okay, I, I totally want to be like 
okay, put this up there and that over there. But the thing is, I don't, the, I can, I can talk about like the pages I'm looking at it right now, but it's not about me and it's not about my browser right at this minute. It's about everybody in all the different sizes of browsers. And what does it look like when it's like this? Oh, that's totally different. What does it look like on a mobile? Only the browser knows how big the screen is, how many colors there are, what the resolution is, etc. Mm -hmm. And so CSS is a pile of clues and requests about how the pieces on the page relate to each other and what we would like them to look for you look like, you know, if you, if you can manage it. Um, it's more like constraints than. Yeah. Yeah. We're giving it some constraints kind of thing. Uh, so, okay. Uh, CSS is about giving hints and requests mm -hmm. um, and the letting the browser be smart. The other thing I learned is that back in the day, back, back in like the CSS 2.0 days when float was a thing, um, they were just trying to make all web pages look like newspapers. That's, that's why float is a thing because you have text flowing around pictures. I mean, why would you want anything else? That's so just like a newspaper column with like, oh, there's a, there's an inline, there's a picture sort of floating to the left of the text over here. And then yeah. later on, there's like one floating to the right of the text, yeah. like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Now that's I know problem. I never want to use that. <laughs> Great. That's super useful. I understand float enough to know I never want it. Here, I'm going to hit refresh and it's going to go away. Um, uh, and, and so I got to throw away that old model mm -hmm. and replace it with a new model. And the new model includes things like block and inline. Mm -hmm. These are amazing. So the, uh, this, any component that is display block goes down. So each paragraph is a block, 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 block. And then inline, which is the default, means uh, go right to left in English. Um, go across. Mm -hmm. All right, so I can, like, I can inspect this paragraph and I see display block and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I know what that means now. That means it's going down. And these images, if I look at them, they don't have a display block, which means they're in line. So that's why they're next to each other. But the thing is, they're also down from this paragraph, hmm, right? Yeah. They're down from here. So they must have, there must be a block there. It looks, it acts like a block on the page. Yeah, there's a secret block. A secret block. The browser puts in a secret block. So, Sneaky. Yeah, yeah. So once I know that, I can make that block explicit and be like, okay, stick a div in here. Div defaults to block display in the browser. Um, and then, and then, um, then I can be explicit about, okay, Jess, I changed something. I have to hit refresh and I have to see the difference before I change anything else. Okay, there's the div that's working. And yeah, it has display block. Mm -hmm. And then from and otherwise there- otherwise it looks the same. Yeah, yeah. From there, I can, I love this. I can insert a marker chain <laughs> in the sense of, I can like make this, this block is not, this div is not currently visible, but I can make it visible. Mm -hmm. I can give it a border. I can make the border my favorite color. Come on. Oh, control shift R. Yes, there nice. it is. Okay, so now I can see the div and when I inspect it, that also gives me a nice little place to stick some uh, more styles. And now we can experiment with Okay, what were those things? Text align center, aha! That's what I needed to get them this way. But if I put vertical align center on here, oh, so middle, middle. Put it on the block, put the, the implicit block that they're in. Yeah. I now put text align explicit. on the block that they're in. Yeah. But vertical align isn't doing anything. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so. Having a good, like, useful mental model of how CSS works, or insert technology here, gives me a couple of other superpowers. One of those is being able to read the documentation. <sighs> so now when I go and I search for vertical align and the secret code word of give me the useful page, MDN, um, then I get uh, a page about it. And I can scroll down to the bottom and find the standard chart that matches what's in the specs, which I now understand. 
and I know what applies to means and it says inline level. And now you know what that term means? Yes, I know I need to put it on the inline thing. So take it off the div, I don't need it there. Put it on the images yeah. and the images are inline. And so if I say vertical align um, middle here, which we saw earlier briefly before I screwed it up, that. Ah. Oh, okay. Okay, so now I have what I want. And I'm free to remove the orange border now that I don't need that extra tracing. Um, and yeah, I got there and I got there like deliberately. The first time I ever did anything on purpose in CSS, I was like, I have a party. <laughs> I actually had reasons for that and it worked. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's what I wanted to, to, to show how um, when, when we have a good solid mental model, then mm -hmm. we can still use spells. I totally use other people's CSS spells, but I use them incrementally. I turn them into experiments and try to form a hypothesis based on my theory, because then I'm improving my theory and refining it and making it better. Um, uh, the, the revolution happens when you throw away a theory and take a, a different one. Mm -hmm. Like it's for formatting. No, it's for newspapers. <laughs> no, it's, it's for, um, it's for giving the browser hints and mm -hmm. um and it block it, and the basic units of that are block and inline layout mm -hmm. and that's just a little bit but it got me a long way and that's a theory that i can continually refine and expand on and i can add more css css attributes and they build on that theory without having to throw it away because it's an accurate theory to begin with mm -hmm. and it's a consistent one and I love specifications for that, for giving me access to the purpose and the principles. Are there any other, other technologies that you've had to like arrive at a, a theory of before you could master them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else have that experience with Git? <laughs> because that's been huge. Um, Git is all about casting spells, especially back before there were uh, user interfaces that would help you. Um, so like eight years ago, um, when I finally sat down and spent eight hours big like watching videos and reading articles and documentation and really getting a grasp on the underlying concepts mm -hmm. under Git. Um, I gained the superpower of not only understanding the spells, but being able to create new spells to do what I want. Um, and a whole vocabulary, like in CSS, I added the vocabulary of inline and block displays and that helped a lot uh, in Git. Once I can talk about the, the directed acyclic graph mm -hmm. and the, the content addressable storage, and I know the acronyms and the, the meanings of what they mean by SHA, and then I can use words like tree and object as technical terms in the context of Git. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly I can communicate with the community. I can ask better questions. I can Google things. Uh, I can understand the answers. And then I can post my own my own spells. Yeah. And then people like you come to me when your repos are messed up. I do. And then it and becomes like, a game. Help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it's totally fun because because I got the graph in my head and I'm um I can play the game instead of just like zapping it with my magic wand that I got from Google until it jumps the right way. <laughs> yeah. This acquisition of models, um, there's a thing that it reminds me of, um, which is when I'm, when uh, teaching uh, basic programming language concepts to um, to mm. d beginners. Um, there's a lot there. I remember seeing a lot of teaching material that would say a variable is like a box that you put values in. Um, and and that was the model that they that they gave to beginners, and then beginners would sort of try that would try to apply that, um, and you get then and immediately you get into strange situations where like you know uh, foo and bar both apply to the same are both they both point to the bo same both thing. point to the same thing. So somehow I've put this object in two separate boxes at the same time. Um, is it now two different objects or is it the same object? Because um, they don't have a model of memory locations. Right, right. You know, and 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 I found like it, it makes a lot more sense to say no. Like the the variables aren't boxes you put things in; they're post-it notes that you put on the thing. Um, oh yeah, just like 
branches in Git are pointers right. to places, uh, to nodes in a graph that move. Yeah, and that's, that's like once you have that, uh, it's like suddenly you can start to, to form more hypotheses about right. suddenly what will you, work. You stop screwing things up by accident. Yeah. So having a really strong theory gives you the power to not just cast spells, but to craft them. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you the power to uh, work really quickly because you can figure out what will work and uh, to, to notice where the problems are going to be. You know, the right questions to ask too, when somebody comes to you and says, says my, my, yeah. my Git is, screw, is screwed up. Yeah. So uh, just like video games are exploring a new world, a lot of our work, and it's one thing for a language system, that's an obvious one or a tool like CSS, but it, this works for APIs um, and libraries and stuff. And then you start noticing that like some tools you can form a consistent model of more easily some tools are very consistent. Git, under the hood, great solid model, and that's one of the reasons that it wins as mm -hmm. version control. But yet, you can also see that when they went and created the subcommands for Git, this went to different people who did not share a model of what the effing, uh, effing user interface is, and they're garbage, and the, the, <laughs> the arguments are different per subcommand, and I mean, AWS got this better. The AWS CLI subcommands have pretty consistent arguments. PowerShell is beautiful. Um, everything has, uh, oh, I'm blanking on that. Everything has oh, um, the same way to get usage and the same way to um, suppress input right. or to print more input. Um, or to redirect it to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very consistent. Whereas Unix has consistent principles of piping standard into standard out, and right. that's hugely useful to understand, but every tool is its own bear. Yeah. So when there's not, when, when you're trying to understand a technology like Git command lines, and, and there's not a solid model that the developers behind it shared. That it is, shows. Is, yeah, it shows, and it makes our lives miserable. Mm -hmm. It's like a game that's hard to learn. Imagine if, yeah, if you were trying to play a board game that was created by three, three co-developers who didn't actually share the same vision for what board game they were creating. <laughs> yeah, I would like to give an example of a video game that's like this, but I don't because nobody plays them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that ramp, that, 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 um, that help is online. But in the end, even though Path of Exile has an incredibly complicated world that, that it has created, um, there's consistency to it. Yeah. That the different suffixes um, interact in ways that people can kind of predict. And there's lots of visibility. The game gives you information about what each means. It doesn't just tell you it's a antagonist castle ruin of rust. It tells you that your armor is 30% less effective. Um, so they've created a complicated world with enough consistency and a strong model that people can grasp it and get a lot of value out of that. And that's what I want to do when I write software. Because here's the thing. Software development is mostly world building. Yeah, yeah, obviously when we're learning how to do something, I've probably beat that into the ground. We're, 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 we're exploring. Exploring. Um, but when we write software, we are crafting a world for the people who use our software, whether they're calling the API, whether they're clicking on stuff. Um, the people who use our software are living in the world we create. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, while we're writing that software, we're exploring that world. We're exploring the theory in our head, the mental model, of how the system we're building works. Mm -hmm. And the code is but an expression of that mental model. It's one perspective on that mental model that we're communicating both to the computer and to the rest of our team um, via the words in the code. It's only a reflection. It is The code is not the model. The diagram is not the model. Mm -hmm. um, the model exists inside our heads and collectively inside our team's heads. Mm -hmm. And if that is a strong, consistent model, then we can write software that other people have some hope of ever understanding. 
Because if there's not a solid theory to grasp, mm -hmm. then they're never going to figure out how to use it well. They're never going to be able to see their purpose reflected in the software that they're using. That makes me think of, of what we talk about in domain-driven design with, with a ubiquitous model, totally. ubiquitous language, ubiquitous I should language. say. And which is not ubiquitous. It is within a bounded context. Right, within a context, <laughs> uh, which all these games are, are Well, it's contexts. ubiquitous, but it's not universal. Right. Universal, right. you can't be consistent universally. That, no. That doesn't work. No, but within your team, within a, a, sh a shared vision for a piece of software, um, you can have uh, yeah. ubiquitous language. And then we can pass that language on. That language is the language of our model. Um, and if we put that on the screens and in the code and in the documentation, then other people, um, both the, the business people who are contributing to this system and the people who are using it, can hope to get a grasp of that model. And that is what I want. When I view my work at understanding the language and other APIs as world exploration, then I can appreciate that the people using my software are also stuck doing world exploration, whether they like it or not. And I can try to make that easy for them. And the number one way to make that easy for them is to realize that my, the core of my job as a developer is not writing code. The hard essential part is what's behind that code. And that is my mental model mm -hmm. of really understanding how this system works. Mm -hmm. That means understanding the business, and how that interacts with the technology underneath and every framework and library and tool and API mm -hmm. um, that, that I'm working with. Cool. So that, so that now we're, we're world builders for our users okay. and we're, we're scientists, we're explorers of the worlds that in which we build that. Mm -hmm. Although we also have a lot of control over that world. Mm -hmm. So, doing our own development automation and bringing in tools and stuff, we can change the world we work in. That's another one of our superpowers. Lots harder for scientists. Building new instruments is easier for us. That's true, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot more access to that. That's what I wanted to say today. Thank you. Okay, Mark, shall we go to Q&A? Absolutely, you guys are right on time. We still have 20, I mean, 18 minutes left. Perfect. For this webinar, self-destruct. I think you you sold a lot of copies of Path of Exile. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no to play that right game, now. it takes years, years of six hours a day, in my observation. <laughs> Animal Crossing, you can have fun in an hour. <laughs> All right. So we're in the channel. You guys, are you guys, you guys see the channel on your? Um... Look at our other devices. Let's see. Everybody's talking about games right now. Talking about games. <laughs> finding a switch oh, right now. Switch isn't possible. Possible. <laughs> oh yeah, that sucks. Yeah. What about the mental models of leveraging constraints rather than seeing them as impediments? Yeah, totally. Constraints, like part of the problem of building a mental model of a system that you're building is uh, like, I hate Greenfield. It's just too wide open. There's not enough constraints. What do I do? Which one is right? Ah, when you find a constraint, it's beautiful mm -hmm. because that helps you like form a solid model with a why. There's a why. Uh, and that's that's great to have. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> Thank you for all the claps. This makes it much better. Yes. Yeah, we were going to. Oh, we Harry going... Potter. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. I almost finished that uh, series. Oh my gosh, we actually left out. Speaking of Harry yeah, Potter. Yeah. Speaking of Harry Potter, um, examples of world building of, of like worlds that you can build on and worlds that you can't. Uh, consider Tolkien. Um, so Tolkien built this whole fantasy world of elves and dwarves and dragons and there's these languages and he built a really strong imaginary world. It was imaginary at the time. It's practically real now. I mean, my kids believe in dragons, but they question the platypus. 
Um, and, and hundreds of thousands of books have been written on that. And whole, whole new systems of world building have been built on Tolkien's world building because there's like Dungeons and Dragons and, and we play that most weeks. And so we're creating new worlds based on worlds created on his worlds. I mean, Path of Exile is probably building on that basic framework. Probably. So that, that has like become part of, of life because it's such a strong world building. Um, Harry Potter, on the other hand, <laughs> I mean, it's charming. It captured the imagination of a generation of 10-year-olds who are really disappointed on their 11th birthday. But uh, it's, it's, it's full of inconsistencies. My daughter can spend hours blah, 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 complaining about the consistencies in Harry Potter. And I'm like, oh, buy a Mac to people who complain about Windows. Um, <laughs> but... But uh, there's tons of fan fiction from Harry Potter, but like Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, most of it is fixing it. <laughs> Trying to fix the inconsistencies and make something we actually could work with. <laughs> You're upsetting a lot of Harry Potter fans over there, Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can work with it, just don't think too hard, you know? <laughs> if, 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 if fantasy books were a programming system I mean, Tolkien would be Haskell, and Harry Potter would be... Oh, boy. I mean, uh, <laughs> nothing that we actually use because it wouldn't do the same thing every time. I mean, it would be... Oh, no. It would be like... It would be like... I don't know, Intercal. <laughs> for reasons. It would be like Ruby, where somebody has done a bunch of, mu bunch of monkey patching that you don't know about. Right. Oh, and adds new monkey patching every year. Every to year. To keep it inconsistent. <laughs> oh, like Ruby? Yep. Ruby with monkey patches. <laughs> Ruby with, with, with surprise, surprise annual monkey patches. Surprise retcons. Yeah, from now on, we're going to call monkey patching retconning. Um, What's that? Retcon, retroactive continuity. When, when, <laughs> like, when somebody, like, when, like, uh, somebody's writing a series like that and okay. they, they add content that's like, we're going to change history a little bit here. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, so there's, there's a question on there that says, how do you tie this in to being, a, being afraid mm. to change portions of the code? Is this an enshrinement and an ability to conceive of changing the current model or lack of confidence in understanding it? Um, usually it's a lack of confidence in understanding it. I mean, if you, if you had a full mental model, which you never do, of the code, you'd know exactly what changes would happen. If the code has a pretty consistent, is consistent and hues to a strong mental model, then you can make really good guesses about what that would change. Um, and then you can test those. So you would at least know where to test. Whereas when you have code that you're like, I don't know what all this will change. I don't know what all it does. I don't even understand what it's trying to do. Why would I want my page to look like a newspaper? Um, then it, you're afraid to change it. Um, and I mean, on one hand, don't feel bad that you don't have a full mental model of the code because nobody does. It's too big for that. Um, but I, I, I blame the part where um, the code has been created and grown without a lot of careful design modeling, like domain-driven design kind of design. Um, so if different people with different spotty little bits of mental model guesses of what they want it to do. I just wanted to put the picture to the left. <laughs> um, have, have, this is like the code base that's, that's grown without, without a sun. You know, it's like a tree. Do you see the twisted ones sometimes that you know they've been like hacked and, and they weren't always in the same position or like at one point there was a building blocking the sun, but now it's gone. And so the tree looks all wonky. Yeah, it's kind of like that. And so you're, you're worried about cutting off a branch. Is that going to throw the whole tree off balance? Um, now what, Go what would you do about that? Um, I mean, you want to you want to start forming a consistent design and gradually moving the code toward a consistent language. Um, if you have tests, then you can just do the experiment. Um, yeah, um, I mean, it's it's also it's you know there's there's which there which parts of the code can we get away with just sort of walling off and 
treating as input output devices and which parts mm. do we need to constantly, uh, you know, are we in needing to change regularly? And I think that's a distinction you have to make. That's true. Um, yeah. Sandy Metz talks about the Omega mess that you just sort of wall off and say, okay, this is a mess, but it works and we don't have to change this part right now. Um, legacy code. Yeah, which, which I love legacy code because the reason it's legacy is that it's producing value right yes. now. So that's the code I prefer to work on. Yeah, that's one of my favorite but it is de challenging. definitions of legacy code is this, the code that's producing value. Yeah. Ooh, tips for refactoring mental models. <sighs> okay, refactoring is a weird word with mental models um, because there's kind of two ways that grow. You can like deepen and refine them. Right. Refining, like tweaking small things like um, um, uh, what is inline block? I can add that to my inline and block displays. And then you can add, you can layer um, flex box and grid and stuff on top of that right. outside of normal flow once you have that vocabulary. And then there's when you need to chuck your mental model and produce and to do that, uh, you can't just chuck your mental model. You can't. You always have one because this as humans, humans are designed to, to make decisions for action. We, we process information in order to act. Uh, so we always have a mental model. The only way to get rid of one that's not serving you is to acquire a new one. Yeah. Um, to, to find experiments that lead you to hypotheses that are, um, a ref that come out of a different theory. Fortunately, in, in exploring software worlds, usually someone has written up another theory for you to use. I think there are two sides to this too, because there's, there's, I, I completely agree with everything you said when, um, on the side of exploring and getting the hang of somebody of a, a pre-existing system for creating a mental model, for creating a world that other people can oh, live okay. comfortably. In your own, um, yeah. There is refactoring there and okay. domain-driven yeah. design- Because we change the, the model. Yeah. Domain-driven design talks about that a lot. It talks about you know, the, the knowledge crunching and the, the, the constant conversations with your team. And especially if there's a domain, an external domain that you're, that you're working with, with the domain experts, where you say, does this, picture makes sense? Does this interaction make sense? And there's going to be a part where, where they're like, I, I guess, I, I understand <laughs> why you drew it that way. Like, why are those two things separate? You know? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the kind of, of knowledge refactoring where, yeah. where you can, you can yeah. hone your language. That's true. And in that case, you start by changing the model in your head and then you look at the code and you're like, the code does not reflect my mental model anymore. And now you tweak And now the code, the code needs to, to migrate toward the new model, but that itself can be part of your model. Um, the model is here's where we're going. Here's where we are. As I change this code, I rename this thing or I move this over to reflect the current mental model. And yeah. sometimes, um, I, sometimes I wish I could just like write a program to update all the code. And while that's physically possible, it would take way longer than would be useful. But what I can do is often I can find a lot of places in the code that I wish I could change and I can stick a to do in there or even not a to do just a, a caution. This is old and we're moving this to this model. Here's a link to the, to the decision record. Yeah. This doesn't reflect our current understanding. Yeah. 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 And that I can automate. Exploring, discovering legacy mental models and users. Ooh. Yeah. So, yeah. So backwards compatibility becomes a thing when you realize that um, sometimes you need to be backwards compatible with the user's mental model. Uh, so when you want to update your interface and make it cleaner, you're breaking their mental model. The world doesn't work the same for them anymore. And that's really painful. Um, yesterday, I was talking with, um, well, with Rod Johnson about um, music software, and he talked about Cubase, which is like the industry gold standard, but it's ancient, and it's just evolved over time to get more and more and more and more and more complicated, but there's this, like, this cohort of professional users who understand that, and you can't just go simplifying the interface that's already simple to them and no one else in the world versus Logic Pro, which Apple publishes as a clear progression from GarageBand. Mm -hmm. They are not trying, they're not hampered by a bunch of legacy users who already understand the complicated stuff. The, 
and have to be backwards compatible with that mental model, they're working with users who have a mental model of GarageBand and progressing them into uh, deeper and deeper models of how music works. Because the real, real beauty of a model in software is when you're teaching the users about the domain. You're teaching uh, the, in, in Logic Pro, you're teaching people about music, about how sound works. And when that is, is, is like the basis or a strong core of the model in the software, you can hope to do that. Yeah, yeah there's kind of a, there's a, there's a sort of a reflection of the structure of, of scientific revolutions in that kind of, kind of um, software progression too, I think, because you, you do see an upstart come along and say, you know, we have a much simplified model and, 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 you know, the old cohort says, oh, we're so, we're so adept and enmeshed in, you know, we already understand how to use Cubase. And then you have a younger set who come along yeah. and, and come up with the new, you know, new stuff without ever using the old. So your, your user's mental model can be a drag <laughs> yes. on your ability to improve the Also, software. if you are selling certification <laughs> on the old model, <laughs> this will be a drag on producing new cleaner models. <clears throat> AWS. <laughs> And cool, I'm glad y'all like the format. It, it, it makes it a lot more exciting for me too. Yeah. Yeah, I told, I told I those guys about how great the keynote went before. All right, I think we are good. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you can uh, join our um, conference for Puciata Talks and you were able to yes. log in and everything. And uh, thank you so much for speaking and you definitely made this conference way better for everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure Thank you, everyone. You.